All right, all right. Red Nation, today I'm going to talk about MA modulation and CT scanning. Why do we want to change the MA as a function of view angle or as a function of Z position on our CT scanner? Coming up here, how are the algae work? So first off, MA modulation. MA is the tube current, the milliamperes of the unit for tube current. And that is one of the ways that we control the flux for our x-rays that are coming in. The other ways are the KVP and the time, but MA is gonna be the easiest way that we can actually modulate the tube current in our CT scanner. And why do we wanna change it as a function of time? The idea here is think about this area. This is like a CT image of the abdomen. Imagine for the simplest case, if we think of our abdomen as made up of just water. If I took this ruler, and I measured on the ruler and I had it like a calipers and measured from side to side. And I take a look and I see across here, it's something like 45 centimeters. And then if I take the same ruler in the abdomen, I go from back to front and I look at it, it's something like 25 centimeters this way. 25 centimeters up down and 45 centimeters left right in our x-ray imaging often you could use a calipers to actually determine the essential path that you're going to be passing through and then you have a chart and you can figure out based on that lookup of how thick the object is that i'm going to be passing through i can look up on my chart what the actual technique i'm going to use on my x-ray scanner is so first off, we're going to be taking one projection image from the left to right. So think about just this ray down the center right now to keep it simple. So this one is the projection or the image from the left to the right. And then we're going to be also taking another projection from the top to the bottom. Just like on our x-ray images, we actually want to change the actual technique that we're going to use such that we can get a relatively similar amount of flux hitting our detector. And that way we can get relatively similar noise on our detector. And in that way, we can actually have relatively uniform noise in our image. If we don't do anything, let's imagine first the case that we don't do anything in terms of changing the MA, what would happen? Imagine we start with a million photons. So we like to talk about the actual intensity of the beam coming in. We like to call that I naught. So imagine I naught is a million photons. So we have 10 to the six photon that we're gonna have in a given unit time. And then we have to pass through this whole body here. So it's 45 centimeters. So the output we're gonna have here is going to be I naught times, and then we have Beer's law. We've talked about here on the channel before. So it's minus the exponential of mu, which is the attenuation times the thickness. Then let's just assume we have just one energy of x-ray and for the x-rays that we're using for standard diagnostic imaging is going to be around 0.2 and then the unit is going to be in inverse centimeters and then we have 45 centimeters here so we can cross those off so now we have i naught times e to the minus nine and out with 10 to the six and then times e to the minus nine we plug those in and we get 123 x-ray photons that are coming through so that's what we would get coming along this long pathway then along the shorter pathway now we have i naught times e again to the minus 0.2 times 25 in that case when we plug those numbers in we get six thousand seven hundred thirty eight right so in this case the data is going to be much noisier because we only have 123 x-rays coming out here here we have six thousand x-rays coming out we've simplified it here there's no bone or anything but just in general you can tell the idea is that we'd like to use a higher i naught here and a lower i naught here and in that way we could get the x-rays that are measured to be more similar on our detectors in what we call our remnant x-ray beam. 
So that's the motivation for why we want to modulate our x-rays in CT. So here's an example of what we call a phantom, where it's a numeric object. And in this case, there's no noise in the actual projections that are going into making this image. And so these are lower contrast structures with no noise. And then if we simulate it and we simulate a perfect MA modulation such that there is noise in these images, but that noise is going to be relatively uniform throughout the projections. This is gonna make the noise in the image to be relatively uniformly distributed and to have a similar texture or a lack of directionality. On the other hand, if we have a constant, so in this case, this is a longer path length here because the MA is constant at the longer path length, there's higher noise along these projections for the reasons we just talked about. So you can see that there's more directional noise in this direction right here. So this is directional streaking and a relatively mild case, but just to demonstrate the fact that if you're looking along a longer direction and you don't do a modulation, you're actually going to have more noise in projections coming along these directions here, these longer path lengths. So then when you back project that noisier data, you're gonna have streaks, noisier streaks in that direction. So that's the motivation for wanting to do this modulation. And in the case of bones, in the hips, or in a large abdomen, this can be even worse. And especially you can see significant artifacts when you start really reducing the dose if you're going to, for instance, a monitoring type scan where you're gonna have really low dose in your images. One other option, we could change the amount of time that we take per view, but then you're gonna end up with angular blurring. Another thing that you could do to change the modulation would be to actually change the KVP. But like we talked about before, KVP determines the contrast in our imaging. So it's not as easy to change the KVP because then you'd be dealing with different contrasts for these rays and different contrasts for these rays. So it's not a simple project then to actually put those together to make one consistent CT image. And that's why MA modulation is really the standard for changing the dose in our X-ray images. So next we wanna talk about Z modulation or the modulation in what we call the superior to inferior direction. So a lot of times we'll call this direction and we'll typically call the in-plane direction X and Y coordinates. And then this is the Z coordinate, which is the direction in which the table moves. So if you have your patient lying on the table here and then your patient has some big bones here, typically in the shoulders, and then also some big bones here in the pelvis and bones down into the legs as well. And then there's typically a big airbag here that we call the lungs right there in the middle. So if you think about the average attenuation for the x-rays as they're passing through these different parts of the body, you could make a profile and it's gonna look something like this, where it starts here, it goes down for the neck being lower and it comes up for the shoulders being higher and it goes down for the lungs being lower, then it'll come up in the abdomen, go up even higher in the pelvis for those bones, then come down some in the legs. We use the terminology DW or the water equivalent attenuation. If you think about the patient as being a bag of water, what would the diameter of that bag of water be in order to get this amount of attenuation for the patient? So we could make a plot of that as a function of Z position. We can use that to actually ask for more MA on the system such that when we're going through the shoulders, we can get more MA. And then when we're going through the lungs, we can get less MA. Then the same thing going through the pelvis, for instance, we can get more MA. In that sense, if you're doing a standard exam of a chest, abdomen, and pelvis, you don't have to stop the scan or do multiple different acquisitions. You can actually do just one continuous helical acquisition and you can change the MA as a function of the Z position. But if we're plotting as a function of time, and like I showed you before, when we were talking about that angular space, 
in general, especially in the abdomen, when we're looking at each time around, we're going to want to have more x-rays going along the longer path and then fewer x-rays going along the shorter path. So if you look at the actual MA profile that's going to be used by the system, it's actually going to be a combination of that Z-based modulation along with an angular modulation. So you'll have those two things overlapping one another such that we're rotating and each time we're rotating around, we're increasing the X-ray flux along the longer direction and then decreasing it along the shorter direction. So both of these factors can actually be taken into account by our MA modulation. Then to actually modulate the beam, you need to have the CT scanner know how the attenuation is changing as a function of the Z position and the angular position. So there's a couple of ways you can do it. Number one, you can use actually the X-ray that we use for planning that we call the scout. If you use that X-ray image, you could use either direction or some combination of the directions. At GE, we typically use the most recent scout, which is taken. That is one option. You can do that. You can plan ahead of time of what the modulation is going to be as a function of angle. Another option is on the fly, basically look at what happened 180 degrees ago. So if you think about like parallel beams going through the body, if you look at what happened 180 degrees ago, then you're going to be not too far off because the patient doesn't change that quickly as a function of Z going in the Z position. So if you look at where you were just 180 degrees before, that's also a reasonable approximation. So now that you know how this component of the automated exposure control works for CT scanners, check out our video on X-ray automated exposure control coming up next.